the Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Well, folks, it's the Paul Leslie Hour coming at you. Interesting times we are in. Honored that you took a moment to listen to the show. We have an interview with a songwriter I have been wanting to talk to, Scotty Emmerich, for some time. He's written some great songs. We'll get into that in just a moment. If you want to support the mission of the Paul Leslie Hour, you can do that. Just go to thepaulleslie.com. You're going to see that button that says support the show. Click there. You can make a contribution via PayPal. Any amount, small, medium, or large, helps these interviews to be heard. And I can promise you any amount, it is appreciated very, very much. What do you think of this new theme song? I am really enjoying this. This is a piano version of the folk blues song Karina Karina. This is performed by John Primerano. You can check him out at johnprimerano.com. Well, folks, let's get into the interview. I hope you all are doing well. Enjoy the show. Hey, it's me. Scotty Emmerich is with us. Scotty Emmerich is mostly known as a songwriter. His name has come up quite a few times on this show. In fact, Dean Dillon, who was recently on, on, called him his little brother, along with calling him a great songwriter. He's written many songs for some great artists, Toby Keith, but also people like Kenny Chesney, George Strait, Willie Nelson, the group Sawyer Brown, Billy Currington, Ronnie Millsap, Sammy Kershaw. It's a long list. Scotty Emmerich is also a singer, recording artist, and performer. It's a great pleasure. Thank you, Paul. That was a nice introduction. I don't know if I can live up to that one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All I can say is it's an honor to welcome somebody who said, I eat, sleep, and drink music. Oh, yeah. Well, I must. I'm about four and a half pounds heavier than last year. <laughs> <laughs> So you're originally from Florida. Yes, sir. I'm I'm from southeast, yeah, a little town called Vero Beach, Florida. And my family's still there. And I, I moved to Nashville when I was 19. And uh, that was in 1993. And Vero Beach, that's on the East Coast, correct? Yes, it's, a, it's about 68 miles north of Palm Beach. Okay. Yeah, a couple hours south of Daytona. It's kind of interesting because Florida, a, a lot of people, they maybe wouldn't right away think of country music songwriters, but there's a number of great writers who've come from Florida. Mel Tillis, Bobby Braddock, John Anderson. The Bellamy Brothers? Oh, yeah, the Bellamy Brothers. There's a lot of them. Yeah, there's a good handful. Tom Petty. Oh, yeah. Leonard Skinner. Yeah, there's a there's a good a good bunch there. Yeah, Florida's a, Florida's a lot bigger than just Disney World. You know? <laughs> Very true. What was life like growing up for you? Well, I was outside a lot, but I, I, I started. Uh, uh, my br my brother and my father and me were all three left-handed, and uh, I always had the interest in music and always sang and always held a guitar from a very, very early age, from three to four to five years old to six. In my time, I got to be around seven or eight. My father made me turn. I was holding it left, left-handed left the whole time, just singing a cappella. My father made me turn it, turn it the right way, and I learned how to play through books and the record player and the, just the music he, he, he uh, grew me up on, which is like 50s country music, like Hank Williams Sr., a lot of that stuff, which is really simple chord changes. And uh, I just fell in love. I always I fell in love with the simple uh, country songs. So life for me was a lot of baseball as a child, a lot of activity, but also a, a lot of uh, music in the house. Now, you mentioned Hank Williams. Tell us about some of the other singers and bands that you would say have influenced you the most. Well, we always had 
my dad's favorite singer was George Jones. His favorite, you know, we had a lot of, as a female artist, was Tammy Wynette because of George Jones. And a couple of Emmy Lou Harris records. Vern Gosden. A lot of the very, very traditional country music. I didn't, I didn't even know about 70s rock and roll really until the ninth and 10th grade. Like my, my parents weren't, my parents weren't, weren't Eagles fans or 70s rock too much. So I kind of learned, I didn't know about Southern rock or anything other than Charlie Daniels until 10th or 11th grade, really. So, and there had already been to me a lot of music before the age of 15, 16. So, uh, Mostly traditional country music. So when you started writing, was that the style of writing you were doing? Yeah. Yeah. Just simple country is what I was trying to do. I didn't... I was kind of a late bloomer in a lot of different areas growing up. Uh, so I was still pretty... You know, I, I knew I needed to be around other people to learn uh, to get better. So I knew that as soon as I could move to Nashville, it's probably going to benefit me better as far as, you know, I wasn't going to go to college, so I knew Nashville would, would be my college. Hmm. Can you tell us about the first time you went to Nashville? Well, the first time I went, my, my mother took me up when I was 12 years old, 13. And uh, we just came up here to see what it was like. What it, what it was like, you know, a road trip. And then, uh, you know, when I moved here was at 19, I was, you know, I was leaving home. Uh, I was about 800 miles driving north. It was cold up here. <laughs> I'm from where 80 degrees at least all year long. And uh, I moved in, I think, in February, March, 93. So it was, it was uh, you know, for 19 years old for me, being from a little town on the beach, Florida was a was kind of a little culture shock. Hmm. That's been so long ago. I kind of have, have bits and pieces of memory of how it was, but I mostly tried to forget it. <laughs> Why is that? Well, I'm mean, you know just I try not to. I've always been trained to uh, look forward and not really behind. Mm -hmm. You know, so I haven't put much thought in those days when I moved here. And what did your parents think about this, about you at, at 19 heading up to Music City to make a go at it? Well, they were always supported me in music, always. So uh, they were nervous for me. But, uh, you know, they uh, there was never any, uh, nothing but support. And um, I, in return, you know, I was lucky I had a really good support as mom, m mother and father. So. I, the return for how kind they were to what my endeavors wanted to be, I, I always never wanted to let them down. So that kind of made me uh, made me buckle down a little harder. And, you know, I wasn't going to go back home as a failure. You know. They were great. So when you went up to Nashville, what was your... What was your initial goal when you were starting out? Were you trying to be a writer, or what was the, the aim you had? I wanted to, uh, yeah, write and record and sing. I'd never been in the studios, you know. I, I wanted to, I wanted to know, what it was, know what it was like to put, to record, you know. I, so I, I wanted to sing and write songs and, and record them in the studio. You know, I didn't want to. I didn't want to go out and play in bars. I didn't want to play in bands. I didn't want to go down to Broadway and play live too much. I wanted to be, I wanted to be just creating music, recording, and so that's kind of what I focused on. Who was the first artist who cut one of your songs? Sawyer Brown, a friend of mine, Brian White. He had some hits in the '90s on Asylum Records. Him and I drove over to Mark Miller's house, who was with Sawyer Brown, and uh, we had met him. I don't know how we met him through another songwriter, and Sawyer Brown was having hits in the at the time, and uh, 
that Mark Miller, the lead singer, invited Brian and I over to his house to to maybe see we write a song together, and we did. And uh, they were they went down to Muscle Shoals and and recorded it. I actually went with them down there, and Mac Mac and I was producing them, and they recorded it in Muscle Shoals Sound. And so that was the first song we I'd ever had as a professional song. That was in 1994. So what was that like to listen back to the finished recording of the very first cut that you'd got? Can you remember emotionally what that experience was like? Well, I mean, it was, you know, exciting. That's about it. I'm, I kind of, you know, I was 20 years old, so I don't really, I can't. Those, those kind of memories are, I've had so many different kinds of, emotions and memories the last 26, 7 years that I have to really sit and try to have a good memory on something and a bad memory on others. And uh, I remember being there. I remember hearing on the radio when it, when it came out as a single and that was very exciting. So, uh, no, I mean, it's a, it's a, it, there's, there's nothing cooler to me than getting to hear something you, uh, you were the first one to be there when it was created. You know, it's lit. It's it's always a thrill to hear it come back over the speakers. It's like it's like being born. Hmm. I'm hoping that you can tell us a little bit about Mac McAnally. He is an artist, a songwriter who has he's done a lot for a lot of people and had quite a career. Tell us a little bit about Mac. What is he like when you're just eyeball to eyeball with him? Oh, uh, Mac is very witty, very intelligent, and uh, very southern, Mississippi, and Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Very, very humble and kind. He's one of the most talented people in the world, and I've ever been around him. I used to read his name on some of my favorite records, like Keith Whitley and stuff. I'd always, I'd always read the notes who was playing in the band at the recording session. Mac's name on guitar would come up all the time on things I always listen to. Some of my favorite records, he happened to be in the in the session band, you know. So uh, he was always a hero to me. And uh, it, was, it was wonderful when I first got to meet him, which was by coincidence. And right when I really first came to town, the first few months, or at least the first six months, I, I got to meet Mac and shake his hands. It, it was pretty... He's pretty. He's a great uh, role model, and uh, a great guy to look up to as far as playing guitar, singing, writing songs. He's he's uh, he's to me has raised the bar higher than than anybody else in town. Well put. I know that a lot of the people listening out there they're familiar with a couple of songs that you wrote that Willie Nelson recorded, and. Um, There'd be beer for my horses. And then also, I love this song, I Didn't Come Here and I Ain't Leaving. And I'm hoping you can tell us, what's it like having somebody like Willie Nelson? I mean, it just doesn't get any more iconic than Willie. What is it like when Willie Nelson, there he is on stage and he's singing your song? Yeah, that's kind of surreal, you know, because he's, he, uh, he definitely is an icon. Yeah, he he's always been so kind to me, and uh, I think he's just like that to everybody. He's a special fellow, isn't he? I think he's what eighty-seven year, this year. I believe so. I believe so. Amazing, amazing. Still going. <laughs> yeah. Well, you wrote that "Beer for My Horses" song with Toby Keith, and you've had quite a relationship in music with with Toby. How did you meet Toby? Uh, I was, I met Toby uh, through TK Kimbrell, who started managing him, and that's still his manager, longtime manager. And uh, I actually, the first time I, I really met him was uh, I was playing in Brian White's band in 1997, and um, Toby had a song out with Sting. It was a duet called I'm So Happy I Can't Stop Crying. That was in 97. And uh, 
we were all at the CMA award show in the back in the dressing room. And, um, there was, I don't know, 30 people in the dressing room and, and we were all playing and singing. Glenn Campbell was in there and Steve Warner and Toby was there singing with us. And uh, he invited me the next weekend if I would want to come out and meet him on the road and maybe try to write a song. So I did. I caught a, a flight to uh, Ohio or Virginia. I can't remember. West Virginia, I think. And uh, met him. And we wrote our first song together. That was in 1997. How would you describe Toby Keith? Funny, witty, big personality, very talented, very smart. I don't know. I mean, I don't have to describe him physically, but <laughs> just as a person, you know, larger than life, hmm. you know, as a personality. And, uh, very intelligent. I think this was, oh, maybe a few years back. I saw this video of you, and you were performing a pretty obscure Buffett song. And I think it's, I think it's one of his most underrated songs, Wonder Why You Ever Go Home. Oh, yeah. Where was that? I think you were in Key West. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Toby was with me, right? I believe so, yes. Yeah, yeah. We played, the, uh, we went down there and... And uh, all the Parrotheads have this convention every year down there called the Meeting of the Minds, and we we played that. We did some, we did a set, you know, for four or five thousand people there. And uh, well, uh, I did it on stage. You probably saw something. We were in the dressing room singing it, right? It might have been. Yeah, I remember thinking that you sing it so well. First of all, and second of all, I was thinking, wow, that's one that you just don't hear. This guy. This guy is deep. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'm a big Jimmy Buffett fan, but I'm, I'm a, anybody I'm a fan of, you know, I kind of get tired of the, of the. I don't get tired of them, but I, you know, I, like for instance, instead of Cheeseburger in Paradise, I would want to hear, I'd want to hear other deeper songs that Jimmy Buffett, you mm -hmm. know, maybe maybe not known for, but that's what you know. Those kind of songs are like. Uh, like you were describing, I did those those deeper songs. Those are the you know without those songs, him writing those songs, he would have never wrote you know a Margaritaville. Those those kind of things just come as you just writing songs, you mm -hmm. know. So, uh, well, who has taught you the most about songwriting? Uh, probably. Uh, I don't know if there's one person. Probably. I've probably written more songs with Dean Dillon and, and Toby Keith than anybody. I've, I've probably written a hundred songs with each of them. And, uh, so they've taught me a lot, but not just one person. I, I think there's, there's a whole bunch of people and a whole bunch of people have taught me about writing songs that I've never met you know, or didn't sit down with just listening to their songs, you know, how they structure them and how they put them together there's so many different ways and angles people come at. There's no set set right way. But I would say Dean Dillon and Toby Keith, those are two two guys that really have you know, have made me a better songwriter. I guess that's all teaching. I don't know. I wanted to ask you about one of your songs, A Kind Word. Has that been recorded? No, a kind word, a cold beer, and a smile. No, uh, John Scott, the great John Scott Sherrill and I wrote that, and um, I got that idea from a buddy of mine, an eighty-year-old buddy of mine in Key West, named Johnny Newberry, and um, he. I'd always ask him if he needed anything while we were hanging out down there. I spent a lot of time at the Songwriters Festival, and Peggy and Johnny Newberry own this old uh, mansion on Southern Street, and. Uh, they're, they're one of the first sponsors of the Key West Songwriters. So, so anyway, I've gotten really good friends with them. And uh, Johnny would always, we'd be hopping, bar hopping, or just going from here to there, just hanging out. And he would, uh, I'd ask if he needed anything, he'd always just say a kind word and smile. So I I, would, I just uh, got that idea from, from that. But no, I don't think anybody's recorded that. I've got a good demo of it, too. I can send it to you. Maybe you can give it to Somebody famous. 
you know, I'll I'll do my best. Uh, somebody somebody needs to. I'll send you that demo of that song. Wonderful. Because somebody needs to record it. <laughs> Really ain't much of nothing at all. I guess you just call it a hole in the wall. But they've been serving the same thing for a while. A kind word. Cold beer and a smile. As long as it's been there, it's been the same. Guess they've seen no. Need to change. And some things don't go out of style. Like a kind word, a cold beer, and a smile. Well, hey there, my friend. Good to see you. Glad you came in. How you been? It starts getting a little hard to find. Well, I've been known to drive for miles for a kind word, a cold beer, and a smile. Some things don't go out of style A kind word, a cold beer, and a smile There it was, the broadcast debut of Scotty Emmerich's demo, A Kind Word. Well, on that note, who has knocked you out with their version of one of your songs? I listed at the beginning of the show all these people, and I'm curious, who who do you think, wow, they really did this song justice? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I've never thought of that. I don't know. I mean, uh, I thought, you know, when I heard, when I think, I mean, when I heard Toby do a, I Ain't As Good As I Once Was, I thought he knocked it out of the park. Yeah, I got to agree. <laughs> there, there are certain songs that he just, he really, really puts a flavor on it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm, nobody could ever do as good as I once was, <laughs> other than him, you know? <laughs> That kind of knocked me out. As soon as we heard it, as soon as I heard him do put his vocal on, I was like, well, that's probably going to be a hit, you know. You've written with some really great writers, as, you, as you've as you mentioned, 
Dean Dillon, who is one of my favorites, but also John Scott Sherrill. What a great writer. Who would you like to write with that you haven't yet? Uh, I don't know. I think I've, I've covered all my bases. Everybody that I would have liked to write a song with is dead now. So. Hmm. I don't, I don't know. I don't think I have any. I think John Scott, Cheryl, Toby, and Dean Dillon are enough. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. The, I admire Hugh Presswood. What a great writer he is, but I don't, I don't think I'd have to write a song with him. Yes, I, no, nobody. Hmm. There's anybody. I need to write more with myself, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, I don't know. I maybe would have liked to write a song with Merle Haggard. I got to be around him a number of times and hang out with him and talk songs with him. That would have been a trip to get to write, put your name on a song with him. But, uh, but not, not really. There's, there's nobody. There have been some interesting places that you've traveled, as we mentioned, Key West. Where was the most enchanting place that you traveled to? What do you mean by enchanting? <laughs> well, maybe not enchanting, but just you were there and you thought, you know, this, this, you just can't beat this. <laughs> oh, oh man, I don't know. I don't know. There's been a number of spots. Hmm. I don't know. That's a really good question. It wasn't Afghanistan. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the beach where you filmed that music video to the coast is clear. Yeah, you know, that's done in Isla Morada. That was Isla Morada? Yeah, yeah, it was in Isla Morada. You can do a lot worse. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you know, there's a beautiful, beautiful coast. Central coast of California is a good place to visit. Morro Bay, and the Big Sur, just going there. I mean, I wouldn't live out there, but but go and see where the mountains meet the ocean and the wine country and all that. That that's that that can be breathtaking. Oh yeah, absolutely. What is the best thing about being Scotty Emmerich? You have made it records. You've been able to perform. You've touched people with with your songs. But what would you say? What's the best thing about being you? Well, I'm healthy so far, so uh, that's all I can ask for, to try to be healthy. and I think that's all we have at the end of the day, our health. So that's probably the best thing. But other than that, the best thing is I've gotten to do what I've wanted to do for a living. Hopefully I'll keep continuing to be able to do that. So, uh, you know, every day is a blessing. Hmm. Probably the best thing about being me. What would you want people to say about you when you're not around? Oh, uh, I don't know. I guess if I'm, I don't know. You have some hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> I guess say whatever they want. <laughs> I don't know. I always like to end the show. I like to just give the guest the stage. So it's not just limited to music, but for anybody who's tuned in, what would you, what would you say to anybody who's listening to us? What would I say to them? Yeah, I would say thank you for listening. <laughs> I would say get a life if you're listening to how I'm doing my life. <laughs> <laughs> you're interested in me? It's boring. <laughs> no, actually, if you're listening to this show, you must be a music lover and. uh I would, I do the same thing. I listen to, you know, I listen to all my heroes and listen to people that do things for a living that are very interesting to me. So it's wonderful that people like you make shows like this to have an outlet so people can reach people like me and, you know, and, you know, gives us an outlet. People can listen to this show like this and uh, learn from it and be inspired by it, hopefully. Well, Scotty Emmerich. I want to thank you for coming on here. Thank you for being a guest. Well, thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. And I'll send you that kind word song when we hang up. Now that I have your phone number, I can send it to you. Absolutely.
Yeah, man. And you're in Georgia, huh? Or Gainesville? Gainesville, definitely. Yeah. Around there. Yeah. You know Gainesville, huh? Yeah. 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 Okay. That's great. Yeah. I knew you'd be close to that. <laughs> yeah, Gainesville. How do you know Gainesville? I'm just curious. There was a great blind songwriter named John Gerard. Oh, yeah. John Gerard was from Gainesville, Georgia. And also, there's something to do with racing, car racing over there. Isn't there a racetrack or something? Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Yeah, that's how I know about it. I've been there before. Have you written with John Gerard? Yeah, I've written. I wrote a few songs with him, and uh, and they started cutting legs off. He had diabetes really bad. Yeah. They cut both of his legs off, and his fingers, and he went blind first. And he was from Gainesville. Absolutely. His hero was Tony Joe White. Oh, yeah. Rainy night in Georgia. Right, right, yeah. Huh? But John Gerard was a great guy. Anyway, he was from Gainesville, Georgia. Yeah. Well, Scotty, thank you so much. If you ever have anything you need to promote, I'm always here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, send me your contact info, and I'll send you some music. Thank you. You got it, sir. All right, thank you. Sorry I was late calling. Uh, it's all right. Have a good one. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Doodly beep bop ba dee da dee bum ba dee boo ra ba dee ka na sa jee bop ki la ka na sa ki la ba dee 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 ka na sa ki